So hi, my name is Christy Webb. First of all, thank you for the organizers for the opportunity to talk about my research. Um, I'm a fourth year PhD student at the University of Waterloo. And today I'm gonna tell you how we know cluster galaxies have a head start in life and death. This is work that I've done with my supervisor, Michael Bello, who presented earlier today and collaborators, Joe Leha at Remco Vandenberg and others as part of the Go Green survey. So Go Green was designed to understand how galaxies evolve differently in rich early environments. I'm going to present one of the first results from Go Green, which compares quiescent galaxies between cluster and field environments at redshifts of 1 to 1.5. I have the benefit of following a bunch of great talks today, and given that Michael has already introduced the Go Green survey, I'm going to jump right into this work. So the GoGrain survey provides an ideal data set to address the question of how galaxies evolve differently in different environments because it includes over 20 galaxy systems with a range of halo masses selected to be the evolutionary counterparts of local clusters and groups. This allows us to look at the redshift evolution of galaxies in comparable environments. The sample includes hundreds of galaxies complete to a relatively low stellar mass, which provides leverage on the mass dependence of galaxy evolution. One of the clusters I've shown here in this image where the galaxies identified as cluster members are circled in green or circled in red if the galaxy is along the line of sight but not a cluster member. It's these objects that make up the sample of field galaxies, rounding out our sample of galaxies in different environments. For each of these galaxies, Go Green has UV to near end photometry and deep unbiased rest frame optical spectroscopy, as shown in this example spectral energy distribution. It's with this data set that we're uniquely posed to answer the question of how are the star formation histories different between galaxies and clusters versus the field, particularly focusing on the quenched population. And to do this, we determine the star formation histories of the individual galaxies by simultaneously fitting the SCD and rest frame optical spectroscopy. It's important to understand how it's really the combination of the photometry and spectroscopy that allows us to make the detailed characterizations of the star formation histories. While the photometry constrains the stellar mass and dust absorption and emission from the broad shape of the SED, it's the detailed features and the spectroscopy that constrain the stellar metallicity. We use the modular galaxy stellar population inference code prospector to perform Bayesian forward modeling and Monte Carlo sampling of the parameter space, which gives us posteriors for the galaxy properties and observational systematics. Um, here are just two corner plots for the galaxy shown in the last slide, where the posteriors in green are the galaxy properties that we're interested in, and the second plot shows the posteriors of the parameters that we have to marginalize over, which are related to the uncertainties in the data or systematics. It's non-trivial to simultaneously fit the SED and the spectroscopy, especially when things like the continuum shape in the spectroscopy are susceptible to many systematic effects. The challenge is to identify the useful information in the spectra while marginalizing over everything else. A second challenge are the degeneracies between the parameters. For example, between dust absorption, metallicity, and age, which all conspire to alter the SED in similar ways. Because the spectra provides constraints on the metallicity and age, we need both the broad and detailed information to obtain the star formation history, shown here, uh, where we use this non-parametric form, uh, which is basically a step function. It's often useful to summarize the star formation history by integrating to get the mass weighted age, or equivalently just in different units, the formation redshift. This metric tells us the time around which half the stellar mass had formed, where younger ages mean that it took more time for the galaxy to build up its stellar mass. After fitting all of the quiescent galaxies in Go Green, we can look at the distribution of formation redshifts as a function of stellar mass and separated by environment. This includes around 300 galaxies, two thirds of which are cluster members, and the open circles indicate the median of each individual quenched galaxy posterior, while the contours trace the combined likelihood space. Um, and I've just drawn some arrows here to indicate the typical standard deviation of the individual posteriors. Now we can compare the distributions of galaxy ages between the cluster and field populations. And there are a few interesting things to note. While there are field galaxies that are just as old as the oldest cluster galaxies, overall field galaxies have a broader distribution of ages, 
which is to say that the star formation histories are generally more extended. This is true mainly at larger stellar masses. At the low mass end, the star formation histories between the different environments may not in fact be all that dissimilar, um, but it's definitely true at the larger mass end. This is a bit more clear if we instead compare histograms of the ages, where here I've just taken the likelihood space and propagated it um, in slices to show the histogram on the above. Um, the bars above the histograms show the median in 68% confident regions of the posteriors, but the uncertainty on the average is actually much smaller and you wouldn't be able to see the error bar. From this comparison, we can say that on average, quenched galaxies and clusters are older, or in other words, they assembled their stellar mass faster than comparable field galaxies. While some component of this result is due to the fact that galaxies with complicated, perhaps even frosted star formation histories are generally more common in the field galaxies, where now I've labeled galaxies that have formed at least 10% of their stellar mass within the last one giga year with these stars and excluded them from the histograms above, um, the result is robust. There's only really a nominal effect to this age difference excluding these populations. The absolute age difference um, is also consistent with many studies that found at lower redshift and around redshift of one. What we really added to this picture is both confirming this result to higher statistical precision and to lower stellar mass. And this brings us to the first part of our result. Galaxies and clusters have a head start in death or to be less dramatic, a head start in quenching. We can now add to this picture by raising the question what does this result now imply about how galaxies evolve in different environments? And to do this, I'm gonna introduce a fiducial model. So consider a PING 2010-like model where we can separate mass-dependent self-quenching and environmental quenching. The cross here is to give you a heads up that this fiducial model fails to predict the sense of the measured age difference. The point to get across is that self-quenching generally occurs earlier in cosmic time as it broadly traces the efficiency of star formation, while environmental quenching, which here we mean any quenching process related to galaxies interaction within a larger halo after being accreted, this effect dominates at later times since it takes time for those clusters to build up. Now consider the field and cluster quenched populations. The field galaxies only quench by the, quench the self-quenching channel, while cluster galaxies can quench by either channel, they just have to end up in a cluster. While this simple picture can explain the higher quenched fractions in clusters, particularly at lower stellar masses, where here I show a version of the quenched fractions measured by Hirschman et al. around a redshift of zero. However, because of the relative timescales of self and environmental quenching efficiencies, the consequence is that the population of quenched field galaxies would be older than the population of quenched cluster, ga cluster galaxies, contrary to the measured age difference. This follows because the second quenching channel for cluster galaxies supplies recently quenched galaxies, lowering the average age of that population. Now, this is a simple model, and importantly, it neglects the fact that environmental quenching can occur in group size halos, not just cluster size halos, and including pre-processing can help make this model fit with the measured age difference, where once again, I'll plug a paper just submitted by my colleague, Andrew Reeves on the halo mass dependence of the quenched fraction with Go Green, which shows that um, this could be really important above masses of 10 to the 10.5. A compelling alternative scenario is that cluster galaxies otherwise just have a head start in life. So returning to the fiducial model, we make one change. While we have the same two quenching channels as before, we add that galaxies and clusters began forming stars sometime earlier than isolated galaxies. If the galaxies that end up in clusters began their evolution earlier than galaxies in the field, then the average age difference would be in the same sense that we measure. And there are a few reasons why this could work. So perhaps cluster galaxies existed in cosmic overdensities to begin with, and hence collapse sometime earlier than those in lower density environments. Or if gas exhaustion is the primary quenching mechanisms, galaxies and protoclusters are simply exhausted earlier. So in the last few minutes, I want to include the complementary information from the stellar mass functions measured for Go Green by Remco Vandenberg, which further support this head start scenario. 
Well, in the local universe, the relative numbers of quenched galaxies and clusters is higher at lower stellar masses compared to field populations. At redshifts of 1 to 1.5, we find to high precision the stellar mass functions of quenched galaxies is identical between cluster and field. In other words, we see an excess of quenched galaxies and clusters, and this excess is relatively mass independent. This cannot be explained by a mass independent quenching mechanism, however, such as environmental quenching invoked by Peng 2010, since you'd end up with an overabundance of the lower mass quenched galaxies. And if pre-processing plays a significant role in environmental quenching, you would again naively expect some sort of mass dependent effect to the stellar mass function. This can be explained, however, nicely by the scenario where progenitors of cluster galaxies simply have a head start in formation, but the quenching is otherwise indistinguishable from the field population. So in my last slide, I just want to introduce the toy model that we use to try to bring these two observations together. So working with this head start scenario, we can ask how much of a head start is needed to explain the difference in ages between the cluster and field quenched populations. Um, so we do this with a toy model that's outlined in detail in my paper from last year, but suffice to say that the small age difference in ages requires only a small less than a gig year head start, which is in fact just consistent with no head start at the 16th percentile. Um, and this is interesting because a small head start would match predictions for the difference in collapse times between high and low density dark matter halos. If we fold in the stellar mass function information, on the other hand, this requires a much larger head start. There would need to be strongly enhanced quenching clusters to explain this. Not only would you need a head start, you need enhanced quenching and protoclusters. While our toy model is too simplistic to, real, to reconcile these two observations, it does suggest that there's something happening in protoclusters to kickstart galaxy quenching. I'll leave you with a recap of the main points and a few notes. I'll advertise a few of the GoGreenworks again um, and the survey website. Thank you very much. <laughs>